Welcome. 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 That proves it's a live show. We would have fixed that if this wasn't live. Welcome. Ah, mwah. Welcome to a late show, all my friends. I am your host, Stephen Colbert, and we are live after the vice presidential debate in Utah. And folks, it lived up to the hype. It was vice thrilling. We'll give you all the deets in tonight's long-running Just This Once television event. Salt Lake Vice, the race for second place. Kamala versus Samala, a heartbeat away from important 2020. <laughs> Pence look great in those espadrilles. Tonight's debate, above all, proved once and for all by comparison what a flaming turd pile last week's debate was. Trump's debate performance last week was a hurricane of bad faith. It, 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 it bordered on a, a, a demonstration of the banality of evil. Tonight, on the other hand, we were faced with the banality of banality. I spent the whole debate on the middle of my seat. It was everything we expected. Pence talked over all the women in the room. Moderator tried to call for order. Vice President got a couple good licks in. And Senator Harris picked up a broken pool cue and beat Pence over the head with the Trump administration's failures. All night, Pence wouldn't give one straight answer, which is kind of weird because normally he likes everything straight. It wasn't earth-shattering, but that is how politics should be. Remember, you should be able to watch it and go to sleep and not wake up in a cold sweat, worried that your health care won't cover cold sweats. But what I'll remember most about tonight's debate is probably that I won't remember any of it. Oh, there is one moment that stuck with me. You'll know it when you see it. Everyone's buzzing about it, but let's earn it. Now, the stakes for this vice presidential debate were unusually high. Unlike previous VP matchups, Harris and Pence could be taking over for their bosses pretty soon, considering that Biden is a 77-year-old man and Trump is a 74-year-old lawn sprinkler full of pathogens. In fact, because of the infection risk, extra precautions were taken tonight, like these plexiglass bears. Gotta say, I've seen better sneeze guards at the Sizzler salad bar. Obviously, the pandemic was tonight's primary topic. It's something Pence should know a lot about, considering he's head of the White House task force on the coronavirus. And he has done an exemplary job at his task of forcing the coronavirus on the White House. The moderator, Susan Page, started by introducing herself. I'm Susan Page of USA Today. You may have seen me shoved under your hotel room door. Remember, you used me to clean up that coffee spill. Right off the bean... Harris reminded voters that Trump and Pence were too slow to respond to this deadly virus. On January 28th, the vice president and the president were informed about the nature of this pandemic. Can you imagine if you knew on January 28th, as opposed to March 13th, what they knew, what you might have done to prepare? Four words. Toilet paper shopping spree. Pence struggled to explain how they shanked the coronavirus crisis so badly. Our nation has gone through a very challenging time this year. Adding, I should know, I was in charge of it. Pence started off with something of a whopper. From the very first day, President Donald Trump has put the health of America first. And by first day, I mean the first day he tested positive. And by putting the health of America first, I mean riding the dexamethasone pony right into the maelstrom of Ragnarok. <laughs> Again, Pence didn't always answer the question he was actually asked. Well, Susan, uh, thank you, although I would like to go back. To the year 1624, women have been showing far too much ankle since then. Pence attempted to draw an insane equivalency to the coronavirus. It was 2009. The swine flu arrived in the United States. Ah, yes. The swine flu pandemic of 2009. We all remember those days when the economy shut down for a year. We couldn't hug our grandparents for months, and Barack Obama would not shut up about the MyPillow guy. Then Captain Pence blasted off to planet What If? If the swine flu had been as lethal as the coronavirus in 2009, when Joe Biden was vice president, we would have lost 2 million American lives. 
And if the Titanic had been shot out of a catapult instead of pushed into the sea, it could have collided with the Hindenburg, killing billions. <laughs> On the subject of climate change, Pence made another hollow promise. We're going to take care of our environment and follow the science. We will follow it, and once it is asleep, we will smother it with a pillow. It will look like an accident, this much I swear. Then Pence threw this Hail Mary. Newsweek magazine said that, that Kamala Harris was the most liberal member of the United States Senate in 2019. More liberal than Bernie Sanders. What? More liberal than me? In 2019, I was one of the top 2% of the top 1% of the most liberal people in the Senate. Anyway, that's my two cents, which I believe should be taxed at 80%. I miss him. <laughs> I miss doing that guy. Harris explained Joe's theory of international diplomacy. I love talking with Joe about a lot of these issues. And, you know, Joe, he, I think he said it quite well. He says, you know, foreign policy, it might sound complicated, but really it's relationships. Okay, relationships. So I'm supposed to make Germany sign a prenup, cheat on it with a porn star, then ditch it for a younger country with uh, bigger Alps. Senator Harris went on uh, and in on Trump's terrible attitude toward American service members and his refusal to stand up for them against Vladimir Putin. Public reporting that Russia had bounties on the heads of American soldiers. And you know what a bounty is? Oh, I know what a bounty is. It's a damn good paper towel to throw at hurricane survivors. How many points do I get? It wasn't as bad as last week, the debate, I mean, because, well, first, what could be? But it bears repeating that Mike Pence would also not obey the time limits, no matter how many times Susan Page politely asked him to. Let Thank me you, also Vice say, President Pence. Vice the President American Pence. people deserve, you know, Susan, the American Pence. people deserve I didn't to know. Uh, Vice President Pence, Pence. I did not, the, excuse me, Susan, the I did not create the know. rules for tonight. Susan, if you want to make Mike Pence shut up, you have to ask him to say Black Lives Matter. Now, Senator Harris landed some blows, and Mike Pence dodged and parried, but ultimately, it was a vice presidential debate. And there's a limit to just how interesting it's... Oh, my God, look at his hair! He's so full of crap, he's attracting flies. I... God bless you, fly. I guess the plexiglass wasn't high enough. But listen, listen, all jokes aside, thoughts and prayers to that fly's family. It's got a quarantine for two weeks now. We gotta get that fly to Walter Reed. Then minutes later, they were talking about a very important issue, but I missed the whole thing because the fly was still on Mike Pence's head and it stayed there for over two minutes. Two minutes meaning that fly has a longer attention span than the President of the United States. That's a long time for a fly. It made a life there. It joined Soul Cycle. you know, it mixed at the bars. It changed his voter registration to Mike Pence's head. <laughs> now, remember last week when Trump wouldn't uh, disavow, you know, hate groups? Well, Mike Pence tonight denied that Trump is a white supremacist by pointing this out. President Trump has Jewish grandchildren. And furthermore, Susan, I want to point out that I have a black friend, by which I mean this fly on my head. <laughs> Somehow, Pence tried to close by painting himself as the unity candidate. Here in America, we can disagree. We can debate vigorously, as Senator Harris and I have on this stage tonight. But when the debate is over, we come together as Americans. No, don't come together. Stay away, especially from Mike Pence. The White House is a hot zone. Speaking of which, there's, there's still so much we don't know about how and when Trump contracted COVID. One early sign of infection is loss of smell and taste, but how could you tell he lost his taste when he never had any? And it's especially troubling that the White House won't say when Trump's last negative coronavirus test was. I would love to release my tests, but my nostrils are under audit. This is important because the negative test can help contact tracers determine exactly who was exposed and when. So today, reporters pushed White House flack Brian Morgenstern for an answer. 
Obviously, you know when he last tested negative. Why I don't know when he last tested negative, and I've, I've answered this question a number of times. Well, to be clear, yes. the White House knows when he last tested negative. I guess simply put for Americans, why can't the White House say when he so last tested there is, negative? They, look, we've, we've addressed this. They, the, we're, we're not asking to go back through a bunch of records and look backwards. We don't want to go back through a bunch of old records. Those things are slathered with COVID. Now, this situation is raising more questions than the White House is refusing to answer. First up, the White House has claimed that Trump was the most tested man in America, and yet they can't produce his last negative. That's led to some to look for a more sinister explanation. According to Jake Tapper, White House officials believe Trump was infected at the event for Judge Barrett on Saturday, September 26th, which reminds me of this wise quote from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Payback's a bitch. <laughs> then, sounded better when she said it. Then, Tapper, hello, Jake. Tapper notes that they won't release Trump's negative test, raising questions as to whether he was tested at all between infection and the debate Tuesday, September 29th. That means he could have knowingly tried to give Biden COVID. He's gone from, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue to, I am death, come upon a pale horse. Joe, let me lick your eyeball. Predictably, coronavirus has been tearing through the White House faster than mono in a high school production of Guys and Dolls, including Trump senior advisor and guy on the subway waiting for you to accept his airdropped penis pic, <laughs> Stephen Miller. Last night, Miller, the architect of Trump's family separation policy, announced he has tested positive for COVID-19. And more alarmingly, COVID-19 has tested positive for Stephen Miller. Now that he's tested positive, Miller has taken his isolation up a notch saying, I am in quarantine. Ooh, if he's looking for somewhere that's nice and socially distant, I know a secure location down on the border. Fun fact, in the last few days, more people in Trump's orbit tested positive for coronavirus than in all of Taiwan. A very useful metric. That gives this news story more context than half of Singapore. It doesn't look like there's gonna be any slowdown to the spread anytime soon because today, they announced that the president was back working in the Oval Office. That sounds irresponsible, but the White House sent out an email instructing any staff who's going to be within six feet of Trump to don personal protective equipment provided in an isolation cart, including a yellow gown, surgical mask, protective eyewear, and gloves. Also, standard issue for all Taco Bowl Tuesdays. We've got a great show for you tonight. Mayor Pete Buttigieg is here. Stick around.